Yes, besides pandemics and war, we, we also have asteroids, comets, radiation from space that we don't know how to deal with. And we had better get the science, technology, knowledge, and cooperation going so we can deal with these threats. Now, our next, next speaker, the Honorable Andrea Boland, is a state representative from Maine. And uh, she led the charge to get Glass-Steagall reinstated in the United States, uh, uh, particularly at uh, one of the sessions of the National Council of State Legislatures. And she's going to address one of these issues uh, for us today. So come on up. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm actually not any longer a state legislator. As of about a week ago, the new legislature was was sworn in, um, and we have term limits in Maine. But I continue to work on the issues that are important to me, and uh, some of which certainly I share with the folks of the uh, uh, Schiller Institute and, and uh, Villa Rouge folks. The, uh, the, the subject I wanted to speak to you today about, um, as you can see, is um, well, this probably isn't obvious to you. Well, <laughs> sorry. Um, maybe the next slide will make more obvious. Oh, could we dim the lights up front a little bit? And the front ones, just because some of these slides are otherwise a little difficult to see. The, the subject I was going to talk to you about is the vulnerability of the electric grid from solar, extreme solar storms and electromagnetic pulse. And I'm seeing some nodding heads of people who understand this probably. And uh, I, I, needless to say, <clears throat> I've been in the legislature too long. I could talk way too long for this. So I've asked to get signals if I go too far with it. But I just wanted to touch some, some key points. Uh, as you look at this, it's just sort of a depiction of what an extreme solar storm or a coronal mass ejection produces on the Earth. The Earth is the, um, I'll, I'll point it out. That's Earth, and so it shows the relative size of one of these coronal mass ejections if it's facing directly to Earth, and obviously it has a planetary threat, and it could, in, in one burst, could have planetary results. And certainly, hitting us in the correct way, the direct way, it could take down our electric grid. And if it did, it would be likely to be down for months and take up to, say, four to 10 years to recover from. <clears throat> so it's not a good thing. It's, in, it's um, anticipated to be 100% probable. This is in the, uh, the nature of a 100, 150 year event. The, the biggest one, as some of you may know, is the Carrington event from 1859, which burnt up. At that, that time, we didn't have a, an electric uh, grid. It burnt up the telegraphy and uh, had effects in England as well as here and in other places. So um, the concern then is to do something about protecting the electric grid. This is one thing one event that could have that effect. Um, the other is a, a deliberate man-made electromagnetic pulse. And this would come from a super EMP, it's called EMP, EMP weapon, or devices of terrorists, which could, a, a uh, oh, okay. I thought that was a little close. The, um, 
So it, a, a, um, an EMP weapon anyway can, can mimic the effect of a, an extreme geomagnetic solar storm and uh, terrorists can use those devices as well. So the, uh, the idea on this is that this, is, this, like other things that we've talked about here, is a global concern. I've been at international conferences on this, and there are many countries are concerned. Uh, I went to uh, one in London that was um, really impressive. And in fact, a, a man there uh, commented, a, um, a physicist from Israel, Shlomo Wald, commented uh, casual, almost casually, of course it wasn't casual, let's face it, we're an endangered species, and we are. Because if this event occurs without us having protected the electric grid beforehand, it's considered that in the first year we'd uh, lose 70 to 1 to 90 percent of our population from um, hunger, cold, exposure, chaos, breakdown of the society. So this is one of the things that I've had the pleasure of working on in the legislature. And in Maine, I'm happy to say that a bill I brought um, passed nearly unanimously, shy three votes, to do something about it. Uh, I, I just asked for the electric grids to do, the electric utilities to protect the electric grid with making the assumption, which I knew was a faulty assumption, that they understood the problem and would be willing to do it if the legislature told them to. And it, it turns out they really didn't know much about it. It was scary to discover how really uninformed they were on the subject. Um, the result was a, a study. The, the legislature turned it into, the committee turned it into a, what we call a resolve to get all the information together and tell us what we could do about it, what it would cost, and how long it would take to do it. And that study is being wrapped up right now. And I have to tell you that the, um, one of the big problems about this is that the utility companies do not want to fix the grid. And it's not because it's expensive. The good thing is that there are tools out there to take care of it, uh, particularly things called neutral ground blockers for the really major transformers that would be nearly impossible to replace in the, in the case of a catastrophe, and we have no spares, basically. They cost about $10 million, they're the size of buildings, and um, they're made in other countries, so we, we can't do anything about it. In order to, to do the protections that we were looking for, are looking for in Maine, just, just to ensure survivability, uh, it would cost pennies per household per year. 25, 35 cents per year for about five years. And so it's not a cost issue. It, it goes to the regulatory issues in this country. And in this case, we have the most critical infrastructure of all our infrastructures. Everything else depends on it. And our almost totally depends on it. Uh, and in, it is the one infrastructure that is self-regulating. And, and the, we, they, they do not want to do this, and so they don't set high enough standards to protect us. The, um, the states have regulatory authority over the transmission lines and distribution within their states, and for some of the uh, generation. So that's what I was looking for in Maine. I want to just demonstrate how how we fail to have standards that the electric power companies need to meet. So if you could go to the next. This is how it's done. We have this, some of the measures that you see here sound a little cryptic, but all, all you really need to know is that what this is measuring is the nanoteslas per minute of um, the geomagnetic field, which, well, it's just too much to describe right now, but it measures really the force of a solar storm. And you have here in red 
two depictions of solar storms. In 1921, there was quite a large one, Colorado storm from New York City. And the force of it was measured where you see that red bar, uh, or red, where the red square, by professional analysts. And the, the next bar below that is another one from, a, from a, um, another storm. And basically what it's saying is these, these reach forces of 4,000 to 5,000 nanoteslas per minute. The lower line that you see going up on the graph that says NERC storm profile, NERC stands for the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. This is where they want us to be protected, the level at which we, they want our uh, infrastructure to be protected. Obviously, two to three times at a times lower than what has actually been observed already. And, this, and these uh, red lines are not the highest effects that we've seen. If you could go to the next one, please. And NERC sets the standard, not the federal government, this association of private utility companies. They could use, they could use data from, uh, from uh, monitoring sites across the country. And uh, these red circles show the monitoring sites. It say, says GIC monitors. It's geomatic, geomagnetically induced currents, electric currents that will come up through the ground and blow out um, the, uh, the infrastructure. This, this is, I, I just want to show you how, where the, there's plenty of data. They just generally choose something else for their profile. The next one, please. And then um, this is uh, a slide. It's pro probably a little hard for a lot of you to see, but the red line on this graph, this is May 4th, 1998 recording a, a, the strength of a solar storm. Oh, great. <laughs> the blue line is what uh, NERC uh, depicts as, you know, what, 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 it, what it was. The red is what the independent professional experts say it was. And you'll see the peaks. And even if they point down what they're called peaks, uh, show that they're much more dramatic than the standard setting organization would have us believe. And those are big factors, nearly two, you know, two times. This is, and these are, these are uh, scales, uh, depictions uh, developed from in either the information that NERC would like to use or the information that professional folks use. And the one to the right of that, if you can show that, this other graph then shows, again, there's the NERC profile in blue behind it for the same event. The red is what the actual recorded data shows. And as you can see, the peaks are much greater than the NERC would show. And what I really wanted to indicate by this is how we've got a challenge at the regulatory government level because they are deliberately understating the degree of the threat here. And then the last, if you could the last uh, slide. I'm just going to read it to you in case you can't uh, see it very well from there. John Kapperman is known as um, a, is one of the nation's foremost space weather specialists. In conclusion, the NERC standard has been defectively drafted because the standard drafting team has chosen to use data from outside the United States and which excludes important storm events to develop its models instead of better and more complete data from within the United States or over more important uh, storm events. GIC data in particular 
is in the possession of electric utilities and EPRI, which is one of their research organizations, but not disclosed or utilized by NERC for standard setting and independent scientific study. The resulting NERC models are systematic, systemically biased toward a geomagnetic storm threat that is far lower than has been actually observed and could have the effect of exempting the United States electric utilities taking appropriate and prudent mitigation action against geomagnetic storm threats. So this, uh, and that, that concludes that PowerPoint. So the point I just wanted to make to you is to show you what the problem is. We've got regulatory authorities who do not want to regulate. And a standard setting within basically the fox guarding the hen house. And everything in our culture, uh, banking, water, food, education, medicine, hospitals, heating, cooling, everything uh, is dependent on electricity. It drives everything. Even gas coming through gas lines is driven by electric power. So I just wanted to make you aware of that and uh, then to tie it into what I've talked about uh, with the, the uh, LaRouche folks um, who, are, who have really educated me a great deal on the problems with the banking committee uh, is we have, people ask why don't they want to do anything? And it's not financial, as I mentioned to you before, it's pennies on the dollar, and that goes nationwide. Uh, I, mean, I mean, pennies per household per year, and that's a nationwide thing. The electromagnetic pulse attack effects from, um, from uh, terrorists or, or unfriendly countries uh, is slightly different, but there are solutions for those too. There are many solutions, and so, this actually represents an, a, a, a potential area for tremendous economic development by actually taking these, the solutions that are existing, many of them, which again are very inexpensive compared to the threat. I mean, it, it would be billions and billions and billions if, it went, if the, the grid went down, of course, trillions actually. Um, so I just wanted to make that obvious to you that we've got hope, really, in one sector, which provides great opportunity for economic development and, and jobs and safety for society and the planet. But globally, there is resistance by the electric infrastructure. One of the problems that we feel that we have identified is that people can make money off the fact that utility companies have to guess about what kind of threat is coming their way. And for that reason, they have to buy extra power at higher costs to prepare for the future. And they have to go through a lot of manipulations that also cost money. So there are contracts upon contracts, much as we have with derivatives in the uh, banking uh, situation. And then there's also the factor of gaming the system. The energy it goes is bought by the by the uh, utilities at an auction where the generators um, are, have the, the product to sell, and the power companies who need to transmit it are there to buy it. And in one instance in New England that is very current, there was there is a um, hedge fund that owns five generating facilities, one of them extremely significant. And what they did is they bought, they had four, they bought this fifth one, and just before the auction, which was only five months later, they announced that they were shutting it down. What it did, of course, was about double the prices for electricity purchased by the utilities. So there are those sorts of things going on, which I just wanted to mention to you because it ties in with the problem we have with uh, banking reform and, uh, and the uh, derivatives problem. I think that that uh, about finishes what I wanted to tell you on that issue. Of course, it's huge. And uh, I just came back from a two-day conference on it in Washington, actually, where where I was speaking. I just uh, would like to 
tell you that we are working hard to try to get something done in Maine. And there is continual, continual resistance from the companies there working on it. But uh, we're, we're seeing some progress. And all we need is one state to get something done to, to actually save other states, adjoining states. Because if there's a blackout, you need someone to, to spark, to, to give a spark, to turn on the rest of it. So that, and, and other states around the country are doing things about it. So those, those are the main things I wanted to bring to you and hope that you keep your attention on this issue and put a little pressure where it needs to be put. The answers are there, it's just a matter of the will to deal with it. And I have to say something about diabetes. I think, I, I have to tell you that I also work with a, a food science company and I, be, I believe you'll find the answer is in nutrition and uh, because we have seen remarkable results with that. And uh, with that, I'll just like to close with the video if we still have time for it. And this is, this is from the uh, London summit to sort of bring together to you the severity of the situation we're facing globally. This is just this is just four minutes. I don't mean to hold everything. We are only one act of madness away from a social cataclysm unlike anything our country has ever known. EMP is one of a small number of threats that could hold at risk the continued existence of U.S. civil society. You want to think of that as a hurricane in space. Just one violent active region on the sun uh, can cause a... Essentially continent wide, perhaps even. <laughs> planetary scale uh, impacts uh, to our uh, critical infrastructure. As Dr. Lubchenco said earlier, it's not a question of if, but it's a question of when. The likelihood of a severe geomagnetic event capable of crippling our electric grid is 100%. We would be facing a public safety, a public health environment, a requirement to provide support to our citizens that would be unprecedented. There will be no supply of drinking water, no food, no gasoline, no transportation, no communication, no medical care, emergency services, government services, banking, finance. I want to say, and I want to say it very clearly and right up front, 
A solar magnetic disturbance, electromagnetic pulse effect on our grids is inevitable. It's just a matter of time. And as I see it, and, and from the study and research we've conducted, civilization is entirely unprepared for this eventuality. Governments and corporations are used to dealing with crises by experiencing them and gradually learning how to respond. EMP and severe space weather are in a different category. We're talking about a black swan event which is not effectively survivable. What we've got to do is to bring to the attention of the world what is potentially the, the greatest catastrophe to have hit the world for centuries. We're finally starting to get beyond that. Where we're no longer admiring the problem. People, uh, leaders, are starting to move forward and take action to fix it. For this kind of a problem, you have to invest in resilience. You have to take preemptive action. And you cannot retroactively invest in resilience once you see how bad the problem is. We've made a good start. We have an adequate understanding of the problem now to go forward and initial steps are being taken by government, by industry. We know what has to be done. The question now is how much time do we have? Will we get what we have to do done in time? After seeing that, I think, Ben, you better get up here right away. We need some solutions. <laughs>